Hello and welcome to the theater. My name is Karina Batchelor and I am the resident dramaturg here at Gable Stage. Today, I'd like to invite you into the world of the White Rose. The White Rose Group was an anti-Nazi, anti-violence, youth resistance movement. The group was made up of friends, many of whom were also students at the University of Munich. Inspired by other resistance fighters like Bishop von Gallen and the Red Orchestra, they decided to write leaflets as a form of protest against the Nazi regime. This consisted of writing, duplicating, and distributing leaflets, all of which promoted anti-Nazi sentiments at a time when simply speaking critically about the National Socialists could mean being arrested or sent to a concentration camp or killed. The White Rose managed to send out thousands of leaflets, some say as many as 15,000 copies, between the summer of 1942 and the beginning of 1943, before they were arrested, tried, and executed. This is their story, told through Sophie's lens. Sophie Scholl was born in Forktenberg, an idyllic small town in southwest Germany, on May 9th, 1921, to Robert and Magdalena Scholl. She was one of five siblings. Here we have Robert Scholl, Inga, Hans, Elizabeth, Sophie, and Werner. The family moved to Ulm in 1932, a city primarily known for the Ulm Minster, the tallest church steeple in the world. Inga Scholl, Sophie's sister, describes their move to Ulm. The name of the city Ulm sounded to us like the biggest boom in its mighty cathedral. At first, we were homesick, of course, but soon new things captured our attention, in particular the secondary school in which the five of us were enrolled. Sophie was a good student. However, towards the end of her time in high school, she would get in trouble and had difficulties at school for not being enthusiastic enough about the National Socialist curriculum that was taking over the German school system. This is an actual textbook which was used to teach racial science. Racist ideas were treated as scientific during this time. Biology linked to physical appearance supposedly determined what people were capable of and what limited them. Any textbooks used to educate students had to be approved by the party. This is a mathematics exercise from a Nazi school textbook discriminating against disabled people. The exercise is titled, What is the cost of care for the hereditary sick? By comparing the cost of care to a worker's annual salary, it aimed to show school children in Nazi Germany that disabled people were a financial burden on the state. One year in the hospital costs the state two years of a worker's salary. Hitler's goal was, to, was for children to learn nothing else but to think as Germans and to act as Germans. Sophie enjoyed drawing, swimming, reading, writing, and spending time in nature. Here we have illustrations drawn by Sophie. The book on the left is Peter Pan, illustrated by Sophie, and the illustrations on the right are from inside the book. Meanwhile, as Sophie is growing up, we hear the rumblings of World War II all around us. A year after Sophie's move to Ulm, on January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed German Chancellor and the Third Reich quickly became a regime. This is a ballot from the last partially free election. This was an election where SS and SA soldiers were regularly on the lookout for suspicious persons. Many opponents of the Nazis were harassed, beaten, or coerced into voting for the National Socialists or forced to not vote at all. Shortly afterwards, there was a purge of communists and the Social Democratic Party was banned from Parliament. Here is Adolf Hitler greeting President Paul von Hindenburg, 
having been recently appointed as chancellor. The degree to which Nazis made use of propaganda was astonishing. This picture was used on a postcard. Its goal was to show a deferential and non-threatening Hitler. Hitler's growing power over the country quickly led to the first concentration camp opening. Dachau was located on the grounds of a munitions factory about 10 miles from Munich. On the left, we have the infamous gates from Dachau, which were also used in other concentration camps, that says, work sets you free. On the right, you can see the moat, guard tower, and barbed wire at Dachau. Book banning and book burnings became common across Germany. The largest book burning took place in Berlin, where over 40,000 University of Berlin students burn more than 25,000 books. The goal? To purify German education from foreign, degenerate, and un-German influences. A favorite author of Sophie Scholl's was Heinrich Hein, who was also banned. Where they burn books, they will, in the end, burn human beings too. Heinrich Hein. In the foreground, we have the largest book burning in Berlin's Opernplatz. And in the background, we have German Nazis carrying books for burning. On August 19, 1934, Hitler abolishes the office of president and becomes Fuhrer of the German Reich and people. In this propaganda poster, it reads, One people, one realm, one leader. Both Sophie and Hans Scholl belonged to Nazi youth organizations as children. This was common for most German youths and was, in fact, mandatory for all Germans between 10 and 18 years of age by the year 1939. Those who failed to comply faced the threat of, of criminal prosecution. The Nazi party youth groups were divided by gender. Boys joined the Hitler Youth and girls joined the League of German Girls. The purpose of these groups was to spread and embed Nazi ideology and policy on impressionable young people. Members sang the same Nazi songs, wore the same uniforms, carried the same banners, and were part of similar activities like hiking, marching, and telling stories over a campfire. They also prepared them for war, and taught them survivor skills and how to handle weapons. It was a big time commitment to belong to the youth organizations. This often meant that Nazi youth leaders had more influence over children than parents, teachers, or religious leaders. It was even encouraged to report back to the Nazi youth leaders the goings on at home, school, and church. This propaganda poster reads, Youth serves the Fuhrer, all 10-year-olds into the Hitler Youth. And over here we have Hitler Youth setting off for Nuremberg, hoping to see Hitler at one of the Nazi rallies in 1938. The League of German Girls was intended to prepare girls to be future wives and mothers, Girls' sports tended to be collective and synchronized, rather than competitive and individual. Girls learned skills such as sewing, nursing, cooking, and household chores. As mentioned before, both Sophie and Hans belonged to these Nazi youth groups. In fact, Sophie became Gruppenführerin, which was the group leader of the local League of German Girls chapter. However, both Hans and Sophie became disillusioned with the groups after realizing the conformity and mind-numbing obedience required of them. Both Hans and Sophie also had experiences where Hitler youth officials reprimanded them for reading banned Jewish authors like Heinrich Hein and Stefan Zweig. This here is an official request for suspension of Sophie's membership in the League of German Girls. The descent into war began when Hitler withdrew Germany from the League of Nations in 1933. 
he began to reassemble the German armed forces beyond what was permitted by the Treaty of Versailles and took the first steps for his plan for the conquest of Europe by re reoccupying the German Rhineland in 1936, annexing Austria in 1938, and invading Czechoslovakia in 1939. World War II begins at dawn on September 1st, 1939, when Germany invades Poland. 1939 is also the year that sees Hans enrolling as a medical student at the University of Munich. While there, he was both a soldier and a student. During term time, he would attend classes. And during vacation, he'd be stationed as a medic in the student company. Meanwhile, Sophie has passed the Arbiter, the high school exam in Germany, However, before she can enroll in university, she must complete mandatory labor service, also known as the Reich Labor Service. Hitler expanded the public work scheme of the Weimar Republic and set up the National Labor Service. It required men 18 to 25 to build government-funded public works like motorways, hospitals, schools, and even the 1936 Olympic Stadium. The men were paid small amounts of money, wore uniforms, and lived in camps. It was compulsory for men in 1935 and eventually for women in 1939. Sophie, hoping to avoid the National Labor Service, enrolls in a kindergarten teacher course for a year. Unfortunately, she is still required to spend six months in the labor service, where she works at a camp in a rural area. Six months later, her labor service gets extended and she has to work at a nursery school. Here we have female laborers who were often required to farm the land in rural parts of Germany, similar to Sophie. And here we have unemployed men who were sent to work, who were sent to build the German highways, the autobahns. This is something that Hans also has to do. Finally, in May 1942, Sophie Scholl was able to begin studying biology and philosophy at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. University of Munich for short. This was a feat in itself, as the quota for female students at all German universities when Sophie enrolled was set at just 10% of the student body. So what was Munich like for Sophie and the White Rose Group? Munich was very important to the Nazis, in particular to Adolf Hitler. He even gave Munich the title of Capital of the Movement, as this is where the Nazi movement started in the 1920s. Hitler had a luxurious apartment in Munich, his favorite restaurant, and was only a few miles away from his mountain retreat, Berghof. Here we have a Nazi parade on the Konigsplatz. Here is the Brown House, the Nazi party headquarters in Breinerstrasse in Munich, which was destroyed by Allied bombing raids during World War II. And the Haus der Deutsche Kunst, also known as the House of German Art, which was one of the first buildings in the Nazi neoclassical style. Hitler himself chose what art would be exhibited. These would be buildings and occurrences that both Sophie and Hans would witness daily. So how did the White Rose Group begin? The White Rose Group began with Hans Scholl and Alexander Schmorell, who met while part of the same medic unit. Through Alex, Hans met Chris Probst, a friend of Alex's from school. Eventually, Willy Graf also joins the group. The friends found they had a lot in common, literature, music, art, and a desire to speak up against the Nazi regime. It's unclear how Sophie learns about the identity of the White Rose group members. Some accounts say that she came upon a leaflet during a lecture by Kurt Huber, a late addition to the group and a professor at the University of Munich, and then found books with highlighted texts that matched the leaflets in Hans' apartment. 
Other accounts state that she suspected Hans had been writing the leaflets. And when she confronted him, he said, it's not a good idea to ask who wrote the leaflet as that person's life might be endangered. Eventually, Hans confesses and Sophie demands to be part of the anti-Nazi resistance group. The idea for the leaflets was a communal product. The leaflets were the legacy of late night gatherings full of discussions about books, politics, art, and music. Through these conversations, they sought to find answers to the questions, how should a responsible citizen act under a dictatorship? How can one stand up and speak when it could result in a death sentence? As one of the friends said in one of these late night gatherings, but isn't it preposterous that we sit in our room and study how to heal mankind when on the outside the state every day sends countless young people to their death? What in the world are we waiting for? Until one day the war is over and all nations point to us and say that we accepted this government without resisting? In June 1942, the first leaflet was written and distributed. From June 1942 to February 1943, thousands of people in German cities found leaflets in their mailboxes, telephone boxes, parked cars, and even in lobbies of apartment buildings. Hans and Alex titled the first four leaflets, Leaflets of the White Rose, which they wrote, duplicated, and distributed in the summer of 1942. The fifth leaflet, entitled Leaflets of the Resistance Movement in Germany, came out in late January 1943 and was followed by the leaflet Fellow Students, largely written by Professor Kurt Huber. It is while distributing this last leaflet in the university on February 18, 1943, that Hans and Sophie Scholl are arrested. Unfortunately, Hans is carrying a draft for a seventh leaflet handwritten by Chris in his pocket. These leaflets encouraged Germans to engage in passive resistance. They sought to educate and inform the public of the truth by listing the crimes committed by the National Socialists. They make fun of Hitler's bad German and tell Germans they will be guilty if they do not wake up and act. The final leaflet, largely written by Kurt Huber, blames the defeat of Stalingrad on Hitler, calls Hitler a tyrant, and belligerently states the day of reckoning has come. <laughs>